Hello there. Welcome to Book Talk. This is your host, Anthony Mwerore. And at Book Talk, we get to hear an author come and tell us about his book or her book. And today we have quite a really interesting topic about a book that is almost 100 years in the making. But uh, I won't spend not even one second because I know we have quite much to cover on it. I'm just going to introduce the guests. Now, we've been having a guest in the shows, but today we have the guests. Welcome to the show, Janelle Maloney and Jody Nash. Good morning. Hi, Anthony. And hi, everyone. Good morning to you. Or if you're over in Greece with Anthony, good afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jody. How are you? Great. Thanks for having us. And I want to wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day today. Oh, yeah, sure. Today's Valentine. Happy Valentine to all the viewers. <laughs> now, if you get to hear this after the Valentine is over, just take it from us <laughs> that we wished you a good one. <laughs> And today we have Janelle and Jody. Now, these two are related, but they are going to tell us how they are related and what it is with the book that is just about 100 years in the making and how they are here together. Now, Janelle, maybe give us a simple introduction of what we are here to talk about. Absolutely. So we are a mother and a daughter, and we put together um, a collection of poetry that is not ours. It's actually my great grandmother's poetry. And this was composed in 1928 to 1932 from an insane asylum in America. So we found this book of poetry after um, many, many years where people had said, oh, it's just an old notebook and there's nothing special. And once we realized that it was more than just a notebook, um, we put it together and got it published. And she's won some awards recently for her poetry post-mortem. She's not, she's not alive anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> but we are doing our very best to honor her by publishing that. Oh, beautiful. Now, why is this set up? I mean, we are talking of which area of the United States? Minnesota. So mm -hmm. we're talking about the St. Peter State Hospital Museum, or no, State Hospital um, in St. Peter, Minnesota. Okay. And that was back, it opened back in 1866. So mm -hmm. right around um, the end of the Civil War. And they were handling a lot of patients that perhaps had been injured or were struggling after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So that was a big time of need in America to address mental health. Now, I understand this was a big story back then. Now, we were not there to understand it or to hear about it. But I understand this was a, a story that was being marketed as the, the woman who never ate, drank, or slept for seven years. That's this right. More interesting. Yeah, absolutely, Anthony. And I even pulled up a... Uh, a news article from 1934, no food in seven years. And sometimes the, the headlines say, woman eats nothing for seven years and lives to tell her tale. Mm -hmm. So in, in 1934, she did an interview after she was released, but my mom can tell a little bit more about what, what fiasco that was. Oh yeah, we'd love to hear that. Well, my dad would tell me stories growing up about his mom being in an insane asylum. And as a child, it was very odd to me. I didn't know if it was funny or scary or weird. And he, I guess I would say kind of downplayed it, maybe because it was embarrassing to talk about or shameful. Mm -hmm. But then he would tell us little snippets and he'd say, yeah, my, my mom was in the newspaper. Said, what? Why? And so Janelle and I started getting more and more curious and we did some Google searches and mm -hmm. newspaper articles popped up. It's like my grandmother was in the newspaper in her day and age. Why, why was she in the newspaper? Well, my, my grandfather, Lewis, Lewis Jr., um, 
he stated in one of the newspaper articles that I was afraid the neighbors would think I was starving her because when she did get out of the institution, and we'll get it more into that, her treatment and diagnosis and all of that. Okay. But when she got out, she was very thin. So, you know, are we saying she didn't eat for seven years? No, mm -hmm. but um, physically she was very gaunt, very thin. So you certainly could surmise that there was you know, not as much nutrition, whether she refused it or maybe had a physical ailment. We don't know mm -hmm. all the details. Mm -hmm. But when she got out, she looked remarkably different. This is a large German woman close to six feet tall. And she was at one point down to 103 pounds. So you can imagine how thin this woman was. So because of her appearance, Lewis stated in one of the newspaper articles, he, 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 con he, that he initiated contact with the reporter because he said, I'm afraid the neighbors are going to gossip that I'm starving my wife. So whether he did it out of some sort of um, perhaps protecting Martha or protecting himself or, you know, a cover story. I mean, we'll never know the complete story behind that, mm -hmm. but he actually initiated the contact then did an interview with a local news reporter and this news report went all over the country okay because of her allegations that she didn't eat and didn't drink and didn't sleep mm -hmm. Janelle can tell you more about journalism and being misquoted and journalistic bias and slant and things like that so we have our own viewpoints on that but um again as a child it was remarkable to me not only to hear my my grandmother had been institutionalized for seven years but then to find out that she was in the newspaper afterwards, very sensationalistic, um, was compelling yeah. and interesting. And that was one of the reasons why we did the dive into the research, because there's just there's too much of a story here. OK, OK. So, Janelle, now uh, your mother had uh, almost, I think, a close experience of this. Now, what triggered it in you that you need to put more uh, time into this and more effort into researching and bringing out what uh, your great grandmother went through. Right. So one of the things that I that excited me was mm -hmm. in her poetry. She was advocating for herself and okay. she was advocating for other patients that were in the asylum mm -hmm. she reveals some patient mistreatment she talks about um what we would call torture these days but back okay. then it was sort of the best that they could do mm -hmm. but she writes about being in chains she writes about being in a cell in a dark cell um if you imagine those dark padded rooms so she she dabbles in that um, that darkness that we imagine when we think of an insane asylum in the movies, right? Torture mm -hmm. chambers and dripping walls. So she wrote about that, but she also wrote about how the patients had maybe recovered and they don't need to be there anymore. Mm -hmm. But because of the social system, they couldn't leave. Okay. And she, she writes about women who particularly have no chance of leaving because mm -hmm back then their their spouse could put them in for the silliest reasons and just walk away and never come back mm -hmm. and they can't let themselves out because they have no rights so i took a special interest to it because she was a woman who had a very strong voice for women's rights and mental health advocacy mm -hmm. but she never had a chance she never had a platform to speak and this was before women could vote. This is before big major movements in America. And so I think it's really nice to see that um, these movements and these ideas of women having the ability to make decisions about their own bodies, about their own health, about marriages, and if they want to be in the marriage or not, um, she was trying to get her voice out. She was trying to speak on these matters. Okay. But because she wrote from the asylum, um, many of the stories she told perhaps would have been thought of, oh, those are just words from a crazy lady. Mm. Those are words from a woman. And so I'm excited to get her words out and mm. I'm excited to right the wrongs on her behalf if it's the least I can do for her. Oh, beautiful. Now, for those of you who are joining us right now or who are getting to hear these now, 
We are listening to Jarin Mualoni and Jody, the mother of Janil, and we are discussing poems from the asylum that is being published by Janil of her great grandmother. Now, would be very curious to know or to hear a sample of one of the poems that she had written, if you would, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Well, she has gorgeous handwriting. Okay. Um, so I could, I could actually show you really quick before I read. Um, I truly love her. Now, even before we go into that, now you said that these were, now it's back then when we didn't have uh, this technology that we have right now. So all that is written somewhere in the notes. And how, how did you come across these uh, notes even before you go into the poem? These, or, or maybe or maybe mom can can chip in even there yeah definitely the notebook was passed down through her dad so i have the possession of the actual notebook now but okay. mom how did how did grandpa respond to all this where did where do we fit into this yeah well my dad was always good at he kept um his mother's diary and he kept a book of poetry and he kept his father's journal so luckily we had additional information we could draw from. He kept many, many photos that are years old. So we could compare names and faces to the people that were discussed in the, the writings. Mm -hmm. um, but he just had a big box in his house that he stored all this stuff in. And once in a while I'd poke around in the box and say, dad's what, what's this? Or can you talk about that? Or who's this person? So I always knew that the box existed Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, sometimes you're kind of like, I didn't know these people and I didn't know how important they were. But again, um, as we decided to research the book, uh, unfortunately, after my dad, uh, you know, did pass away, he mm -hmm. made it to 96. Um, he said, hey, you can have the family stuff because you're the only one interested in it. And um, so I got it and, and Janelle got access, access to it. And it was a treasure trove. So one, one of the little side points we wanted to bring out to people, whether they're interested in poetry or mental health or mm -hmm. biography, because the book's a little of everything, medical mm -hmm. analysis, I think there's something in there for everyone. But one of the little things we did want to encourage people a takeaway was, uh, you know, document your family stories, even if you handwrite them, you know, or you do one of those grandma or grandpa remember type books or record video, record your life story. Um, leave that for your family, the stories and the details. And uh, I know, as you mentioned earlier, things are much more digital now, but label photos. So years from now, people know who was in those photos. So, um, you know, so that may as one takeaway for people. If they're like, how, how do I connect with this book in terms of family history is start preserving your family history. So my dad, to kind of summarize, my dad did a great job. He left us a nice um, trail of cookie crumbs to follow so that we could pull the story together and be accurate and verify everything that was said. No, that's just beautiful. <laughs> I, I confess, I don't have a single item from my grandfather. I, I didn't oh. find him alive. I don't have a single item that I can say this is from my grandfather, leave alone my great grandfather. So this is just very beautiful. And, 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 and as you pass the word around, yes, we need to keep more records. We need to take, and I, at some point I look back even when I was going through school and I say, I should have taken more records of where I was passing, what I was doing, some <laughs> more photos of myself. So this is just very encouraging. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that, Jody. We really appreciate that uh, inspiration. Now let's hear more inspiration from one of the poems. Definitely. So I pulled out one of the poems called Memories and it is published in the book. All of the poems are published, but I wanted to show you it is her writing. So okay. they are very lightly edited. Um, so you, what you see is what you get. And she wrote at the end, behind prison walls where Satan now calls, I march by prison rule. I'm judged as a goof, a sap, and a nut, and classed far less than a mule. 
which is really sad mm -hmm. that she she was in the asylum. She's not mentally ill. We fully believe she had, um, I, I would say, perhaps normal marital problems. Okay. Um, but as far as being insane, no. So she suffered and she was taught and told, you have no rights. You're just like all the others. You're crazy. You don't deserve to come out. She was taught these things by the system. And yet there was nothing she could do. So I like this, that she fights back and says, huh, okay, you, you class me as lower, lower than a donkey. Mm -hmm. But uh, she wrote it down. She captured that moment. And it's good that we are getting encouraged from a woman who lived almost 100 years back. And it, it's good that you share this because uh, I have experienced uh, this kind of situation in families that um, we get to go, someone go into depression because of being surprised suppressed and being denied some of our rights. So it's something living even today, even with this, mm -hmm. when, when the, the world has been so enlightened, there's no more slavery, there's no more, I mean, what you may call, I don't know, but uh, you get what I'm, I'm going at. But uh, we do have these experiences. Have you come across your, the, them yourself, even uh, that inspired even you more to go into this that you're doing now? Oh my goodness, Anthony, I, in a similar situation, uh, in a different book that I'm writing, okay. I am writing about another relative who in 1864, so back in 1864. Civil War times, <laughs> yeah, in 1864, <laughs> she went over the Oregon Trail in a wheelchair yeah. as an older woman. And mm -hmm. so I see her story as being very powerful. And yet when I tell her story, now, and I'm, I'm putting together the book and I'm putting together articles, I hear people asking about the men that were involved in the story, the okay. husbands or the famous cowboys. And I keep wanting to resist that. And I say, but the story is not about the men. Mm -hmm. And yet the readers continue to shift towards the cowboy story. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that as an author, I feel like I, I'm actually trying to write a woman's tale and yet as soon as you put it in the american west it must be a cowboy story uh -huh. and so i feel that pressure i feel like this is how it's always been so this is how it must always be mm. it's good 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 and uh, it's good that uh, we are having new ladies come and uh, voice out some important uh, things that should be happening in the society. Now, I can, at, at this point, I come to imagine, now we talk of things that happened in the past, uh, women being suppressed, uh, people of color being suppressed, uh, women, not, this is not the, the topic today, but uh, it's something that is out there. And uh, now that you are coming out strongly and advocating for human, uh, no, for women rights and uh, yeah, even women are human, so human rights. Uh, I come to think of it that in the history of the American, uh, America or of the USA, we've never had a woman president. Not yet. So, so close. So, so, yeah, so close, so close now. So it's good that you are unearthing this past uh, uh, things, past uh, details that, that uh, women had been suppressed in so that uh, you can encourage more women to rise up, speak out uh, to, uh, about uh, themselves and about uh, other people who are being suppressed in their own lives. So thank you very much, Janelle and uh, Jody, for this effort that you've given to this uh, book that is just about, it's just about to be published, yeah? It actually came out last year at Thanksgiving oh. time, but now it's getting all of the attention now that it's in people's hands. But it's also at a few different museums and um, gift shops for strange books. So we're getting um, a very eclectic mix of readers. We get the people who really like reading about the asylums, and then we get the people who really like reading biographies, mm -hmm. and of course, poetry enthusiasts as well. So we're starting to get this really motley crew of readers, and they're all interpreting the story in their own unique way, which mm -hmm. I think is part of the fun, that mm -hmm. every single individual gets to interpret poetry at a personal level. Yeah. So 
I like that, that we, we get reviews and they tell us, oh, I can't believe she went through this, this, and this. And we say, oh, we never said anything about that. Mm -hmm. But that's how they interpreted the poetry and they felt strongly. And so we really empower the reader to make their own decisions and um, receive their own value from what they're reading. And it's good that you published it in her own name, not your name. Right, we did the research, but mm -hmm. it's her poetry. Okay, oh, it's beautiful. So, uh, thank you very much. We are really honored to hear about this uh, book, Poems from the Asylum by Mother Nash, written and uh, researched and written, republished by Janelle Maloney. Maloney. Thank you very much. And um, I, I, if you would like to add something, even as we proceed at this point, what would you like us to very much know from this uh, book? I, I'd, I'd like to add a couple points, and yeah. maybe this is in reference to Valentine's Day, I suppose. But uh -huh. I, we saw some reader feedback on social media where somebody said, "Well, I don't, I don't want to read the book because it sounds depressing." Mm -hmm. Certainly what she went through was difficult and challenging. We're not downplaying that at all. But I feel like the message people will take from the book is this is a woman who came out of that experience and was very resilient and, you know, I, in today's terms, recovered or healed, I suppose you'd say. I mean, certainly she went through some trauma. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But that people would take away that really the point is she survived this. She survived mm -hmm. this experience and came out on the other end. So going back to, to Valentine's Day, how does this relate to Valentine's Day? You, you might think, well, this is such an odd connection, but honestly, it's a love story. The mm -hmm. book is a love story. Now, having said that, it's a love story gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I do believe readers could relate even to that to say, you know, sometimes we have broken hearts. Sometimes it might manifest itself in sadness, depression, loneliness, not trying to depress anyone out there. But I think it's relatable even on that level to say, you know, affairs of the heart, so to speak, affairs of the heart do um, affect us. And, um, you know, nowadays you could go to therapy or counseling, I suppose, uh, it, go have a cup of coffee with a good girlfriend and chat it out. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't have those options back then. And yeah. um, one of the things, I don't think it's a spoiler alert, but one of the things we didn't mention was um, prior to Martha's committal, um, she received a perfumed letter in the mail. Uh, she intercepted it and it was addressed to her husband. Mm. So throw in perhaps some infidelity, perhaps some adultery, perhaps it was simply an affair of the heart. We'll never know the truth on that. Okay. But she references this perfumed letter and regardless of how, I don't, I don't know what you wanna say, consequential the letter actually was or, or what actually happened, the backstory, um, she was devastated. As I'm sure many of your um, readers out there, whether they're male or female could, um, <laughs> relate to if they've ever gotten um, anything like that, any inkling of, of uh, cheating in a relationship, it'd be very hurtful, very harmful. You know, you'd feel betrayed. Mm. So we're not necessarily saying that prompted her committal, but yeah. we believe it was one more factor of, you know, having that broken heart, having that broken heart. And then maybe there were other physical factors we believe on top of that so you combine the mental and the physical and um you know it's going to take a person to perhaps a dark place so but having said that i wouldn't necessarily say it's a happy ending but that encourage readers that martha comes out of it okay she comes out okay in the end and it's it's good to share the dark times and uh, when we are lost because Someone out there could be in a situation that uh, we are in or we were in and uh, by sharing it and talking of how we came out of it or showing the other side of it after being there, it could encourage someone out there. You never know. And, and I believe this is the reason that you are doing it so that you may encourage some people out there. 
Anthony, there's another, another layer, I would say, um, to the book where Martha, actually, this is her wedding picture from 1913 or 14. But in World War One, which was right after her wedding, there was an entire movement of anti-German sentiment okay. that would be another layer of oppression that she stood up to and stood up um, in the best way she could. Mm -hmm. But her parents were German immigrants and to our knowledge and to her writing, they never learned to speak the language. And she was raised up to become American as fast as possible. Okay. And her siblings, instead of Maria, it's now Mary, you know, they changed their names and there was pressure to stop speaking their language there's pressure to stop displaying their cultural heritage and we know from local research and other historians have confirmed some folks who continued to present themselves as being um, of german ancestry they were tarred and feathered like you see like you're reading from mark twain's books ab yeah. about slavery in the south they were and this was not that long ago Mm -hmm. So during World War One and in between World War One and World War Two, she would have been taught by the world that she definitely cannot be who she is. Mm -hmm. She cannot be a woman. She cannot be outspoken. She cannot have control of her body. She can't be German. She can't be German American. That she could not be anything. And so there was a whole other layer. And we peel back those layers and take a look at what does it mean to be an immigrant in America. And even though she was born in America, yeah. just that association made it more challenging and how she overcomes and deals with those um, prejudices against herself and also how she protects her son mm -hmm. from a similar experience being the second born in the country and how she raises him to be truly um, an all American boy. However, it comes at a cost where they made sure he didn't learn German. He didn't mm -hmm. learn their mother tongue and he, okay. he wasn't following those traditions. And so I've seen that in um, some of my friends that I have in, in America who they've come from Nigeria and there's just this gentle slope of losing a little bit more and a little bit more and becoming more and more American. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the story as well of, of transitioning and losing that tradition and that identity. Uh, thank you. And if I may ask, because we, we say these are the poems and uh, you tell the story. In the book, there are sections that you tell a story and then give a poem. That's what I imagine. Yeah, that's a uh -huh. good way to think of it. Yeah. So we we present her her history right up front so the reader understands who she is and where she's coming from. Okay. Then we present her poetry and after not all of them, some of the poems we don't want any interpretation. Okay. So some of some of the poems have explanations that go with them. Mhm. Mm and then at the end of the story, we talk about her release from the asylum and the conditions of her release and the media interview that I guess back then she got, she went viral. Okay. So we talk about the results of that and how from the media interview, from her words, we were able to pinpoint a uh, very plausible medical diagnosis okay. where she actually just had an injury and she was trying to explain the symptoms of her injury. But back then, doctors, scientists, they didn't know what she was talking about. This injury did not exist mm. or they didn't understand. So they, in their ignorance, instead of looking further into it, said, well, what you're telling us is not possible. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're lying. You're delusional. So we uncover the mystery at the very end um, using 100 years of medical research to really pinpoint what it is. And it's very common, Anthony. People still have these types of injuries today. And yeah, they do. We've, we vetted the book with them and they said, oh yeah, she definitely had it. What she says and what she's writing about, that's how I feel every day of my life. And I don't know that she was ever cured or healed from it. It might've been a permanent injury, but ultimately she learned how to manage and she learned um, how to go on living her life despite 
the constant symptoms. Mm. Now, you know, the person, the human that was there a hundred years back or 2000, 200 years back is the same human that is living today. I mean, so I, I would imagine that uh, people are going through the same thing even today. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, at this point, I want to thank each and every person who may be watching us or who may listen to this after we are through with this. <laughs> and uh, I have one particular uh, viewer who is known as John Kafue Nyaga. And he says, as you put it, the in thing is coming out strong, regardless the pain. That is what uh, Jody shared uh, previously. Now coming out strong is what counts. So in the end, the story is beautiful. In the end, the story is encouraging someone out there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank, you, thank you for that comment. We appreciate any feedback. And, and even for those of you listening to this live or later on, we'd love to hear your comments or questions. If we can you know, maybe go into more detail and answer your questions, we'd love to do that. But I also like to share too, in terms of, I, I suppose another takeaway, and this might be a little bit more uh, metaphorical, I suppose. Okay. But I've shared in other interviews that, you know, even if you think about that person's B DNA being a part of you, that, you know, my grandmother's DNA is in me, my grandmother's DNA is in Janelle. And when you go through that story, you walk away, again, kind of going back to family history, but you walk away going, owning that, that, you know, it's obviously DNA is not just cells and genes and, and all of those medical terms that we learn about in school, but it's her strength, her, mm -hmm. her courage, her, you know, fortitude, you know, again, the resilience. So that has kind of, um, you know, kind of sunk into my heart and, in, 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 you know, feeling like that was also passed on to Janelle as well, that, you know, really understanding that this is my opinion. So it might be getting a little out there, but that DNA is more than just um, at the cellular level. I, I believe it does speak somewhat to, uh, well, I mean, we know it passes on personality traits. We know that, but it passes on personality traits and maybe it passes on even more than that, that we're just learning about now or just becoming aware of. So, um, you know, even knowing your family's DNA in you, I, I think uh, is just, it's just phenomenal. It's just compelling. It's, now, it's, you, you, affirming. You remind, it's very affirming. You, you remind me of a story. I don't know whether you know this, but uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, there is a motivational speaker known as Les Brown. Uh, maybe you know him, maybe mm -hmm. you don't. Mm -hmm. Now, Les Brown was uh, born and abandoned uh, by the mother. So he never got to know his mother. And he was brought up, he was adopted by a mother that brought him up until he was uh, big enough. He went uh, to uh, school to call, uh, no, he didn't go, he didn't actually get a college degree, but he's, he worked and became very known worldwide. At uh, last year, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, he was about 76 years old and uh, his son con conducted a DNA test and found his mother, wow. his parents. Wow. Now, the thing, the most uh, uh, intriguing thing in this story is that Les Brown came to discover that his grandmother was a motivational speaker back oh. in the days. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my theory has been proven. Thank you. It's, it's, it's been proven somewhere. It's been proven somewhere. So uh, I can already see some Martha in Janelle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the well, strong the, woman that mother was. Yeah, for sure. The outspoken, the feisty. That's Well, Anthony, I want to offer for those who are watching whether it's now or a week from now that if you are responding and posting your questions or posting your comments i'm happy to take a look throughout the week and be able to add and respond and answer to those questions so i'll be checking in on the book talk page 
to assist with those communications. I'm very, very interested to hear what you have to think, and I'm wanting to um, correct any misperceptions or elaborate on anything that you want a little bit more on. And, and now yeah. at this point, let me, okay. Uh, well, plus I was gonna mention, sorry, I was gonna mention we do have our uh, Facebook page called Seven Years Insane. So if you want to follow the book project, and there's a lot of photos on there and some of the backstory, um, take a peek at our, our Facebook page, Seven Years Insane, and it, it talks about the book. As I said, there's some stories on there, some photos, and um, you know you, you can get you know even more of a, a backstory on the book project. Oh, thank you very much. So Seven Years Insane, the Facebook page that you can get to know much more about these poems from the asylum and uh, interact with uh, Janelle and Jody. Now, at this point, even uh, let me ask uh, Janelle, you are the author and you've authored some other books. Is this your full time job or you have another profession? <laughs> I am blessed. I am fortunate enough to actually write and teach writing as my entire profession. Mm -hmm. And now maybe you don't know where I'm driving to because uh, with this research that you have done, which you may have got some um, idea into how to deal with uh, such kind of uh, situations, such kind of um, uh, ideas or stories that uh, your great grandmother went through. You could be helping a lot of people. If maybe you have some, uh, if you keep it up and uh, maybe get to learn a bit more of how to deal with the situation, you could help many people once they come back after reading the book. Yeah. So another book that's out right now is called Unadoptable, Faith Beyond Foster Care. And that one explores current mental health issues in children in America okay. and how um, children in foster care are perhaps not getting a good quality of mental health uh, care and okay. they're not having their issues being addressed. So I'm an adoptive mother and I advocate for mental health care in children through that book. And um, I present a case for even just within six months because the book only tells a story that's six months long. Oh. How radical, unbelievable change mm -hmm. can happen when you as a parent or perhaps you as a loved one, when you believe that there's more to a person than just a diagnosis. Yeah. And the love just comes out. The healing becomes manifested. It's very possible when we, we believe there's more to a person than just mm -hmm. what's on paper. Yeah. So that one's, that's an award-winning novel and that's available worldwide. Okay, so where can we get these books if we want to purchase them, please? Well, most easily on Amazon and a few different um, major retailers in the UK have picked up the book and it continues to spread and catch awareness all over the world. But it is currently only in English. So uh, perhaps maybe one day it'll be translated, um, but Amazon would be the best place to get it worldwide. Okay, so for those of you who... I've enjoyed the story. Go ahead and get the book, Poems from the Asylum. And the other one is? Unadoptable, Faith Unadoptable. Beyond Foster Care. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. So once again, we want to thank you very, very, very much, Janelle and Jody, for being with us here and sharing with us this beautiful story of Mother Nash, Poems from the Asylum. Thank you so much. Thank very you, Anthony. Good. We really appreciate it. But before we go, is I, I usually ask my guests to say a few words that we should always remember. So we're going to start with uh, Janelle <laughs> and then go to Jody. Um, the most important thing, the most important takeaway for me is that we should be able to record our own legacy. Don't let a hundred years pass and people are still trying to figure you out. Um, if you want people to know that you are uh, passionate, strong, if you're intelligent, all of those things, write it down, record that and take responsibility for who you are and what your legacy is. Mm. And also write a book. <laughs> Jody. Well, 
Janelle stole my answer, but <laughs> my, my answer again, I mean, this whole project has been honestly a passion project for both of us. I mean, we got so excited and so interested and I mean, we, we ended up interviewing neighbors of descendants who lived in Martha's neighborhood that knew of her or knew her name, you know, knew the neighbors related. So I guess I would add to her point, document everything you can about your family, uh, pass it on. But also what we got out of this project was how our stories connect us to other people. So mm. we met people via social media. Uh -huh. When you post a photo on some of these social media sites and, you know, specific ones to the area we were researching and, Hey, does anyone know who this person in the photo is? And we got answers to, Oh, well, that's my dad. That's my grandfather. That's my uncle. So, uh, pictures of my dad with other neighborhood kids is what I'm saying. Oh. But we were able to not only in terms of research, identify who those people are. But so my other takeaway is we now connected with those people. And it's super cool. We formed a little group called the Martha ladies and we communicate about family history and research and um, you know, upcoming things that are happening related to the book. And so in addition to our own research, it's definitely connected us to other people. So mm -hmm. that connection there of sharing your story is going to connect with other people. And that, that's been really one of the most fun aspects of this project is we built relationships that will continue on because of the book project. Oh, that's wonderful. We really appreciate uh, you sharing that. And I am very happy for you and uh, what you're doing. And uh, we are wishing you more success, more relationships, more connections. And you never know, change as many lives as you can through these words that you are sharing. So thank you very much. And I'm going to start today, or, or rather I'm going to put more effort today into uh, recording, uh, documenting my life. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, thank you. yeah, thank you, Janelle, thank you, Jody. And thank you to all you, the viewers who have watched us and those who are listening. You can get uh, all these recordings in, any of the famous podcast uh, uh, podcast platforms, uh, Google Podcast, uh, Stitcher, uh, Audible, name it. So go and enjoy. Search for Book Talk at Bookplace, and you will get to hear all of them. Thank you very much. Bye, and God Bye. bless you. Bye.